by live streams so that they can stay home. Um, and thank you particularly to the public servants who are, even at this moment, doing double duty, um, dealing with uh, a, a, a really tragic crisis in our state right now. Um, it's just really kind of you all to be here tonight. I know there's many of you who are public servants. As a matter of fact, just to put a strike hands, who here is in public service, either at the state or at other levels? Oh, yeah. Hello. Well, thank you all. <laughs> No, it's really it's really nice to see that num that many people here. Um, uh, you're all our heroes. Um, as are um, many of you who work with the state or with other government entities. I know a number of people who are defenders here. Can you raise your hand? Thank you so much also for being here. Yeah. Part of the change team. Um, and then for those of you who haven't raised your hand, I assume there is it is it social sector like us which we in between social sector. <laughs> Any, anyone else want to shout out for a group we haven't? Corporate sponsors. Corporate sponsors. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, um, I really appreciate your uh, all being here tonight. You know what we're going to talk about. Um, but first, I just want to tell you a little bit about. And I see many familiar faces, so I don't want to belabor these points. Um, but as you know. We are Code for America. You'll all be either um, excited or a little bit sad as we are to hear that this is probably the last event that you will do that you wish it for that you will come to in this office. We are moving down the street. So look around, enjoy yourself. We're going to make sure we have to That will be a new space on mission between the uh, But we have, we have events here very often and have been um, very grateful to have all of so many people show up and, and engage in these conversations with us. Um, for those of you who don't know, Code for America is a nonprofit that uses the principles and practices of the digital age to improve how government serves the public. And critically, and I know that there are some folks from Code for America debates here, particularly Code for Day and Code for Oakland, how the public improves government. Uh, we believe that, as it is on our wall, that government can work for the people and by the people, the way we expect it to in a digital age. We believe that services can be simple, accessible, and easy to use, that outcomes can be measurably better, that better can cost less, and that we can serve everyone in our country with respect and dignity. Mm -hmm. And we believe, thank you, and we believe that this would be the biggest source of societal good for a generation, and we all have to Uh, I'm not going to do those slides. Um, <laughs> um, the reason we're gathered here tonight is that uh, California is important. It's not just important to us here, because I assume almost all of us here live in California. Um, but it's important because our national landscape is complicated. Uh, and California not only can now, I think, lead the nation in terms of digital strategy, in terms of showing what we talked about, showing government working can, as it should for the American people. Um, I think it actually has to be. It's certainly in the right position to be. We're going to hear a little bit more why it's in that position um, to be. Uh, we have just elected um, our new governor, uh, and I'm excited about who that is because he has shown a lot of interest in this topic. Back from uh, his days writing Citizen Bill, which actually has proof for America. Uh, championing open data, he was the mayor of San Francisco. Um, but the conversation has really evolved since those days. Um, we've learned a lot. I remember, you know, 2011, me doing Code for America, and though I'm very proud of everything we did, um, man, am I a different person today than I was then. Man, are there a lot of things that we've learned about how digital really works in government and how it works at scale and how data plays in? And um, one of the things I think is like the most important thing for our community to do is not just talk about how pretty it's going to be and how lovely it's going to be when we all get this right and we have these beautiful visions, but talk about how hard it is to get there because it is real hard. Um, and uh, in fact, I was just reminded by. Uh, to folks who are working on the child welfare system um, in California right now, how inspired they were um, by what Dan said at the Summit. Um, 
um, uh, it's so hard that it's scary at times, <laughs> uh, and you don't want to do it, but you do it anyway. Wait, I'm now messing up. Well, we can't do this. Can't do this. Do it anyway. Um, so um, tonight we're gonna uh, we're gonna I quickly review the story of do it anyway, doing this incredible purge and bravery, uh, changing the frame in which California does digital. Um, looking back a little bit, uh, and then looking forward, because this is a really important time for us to look forward, and we really need to do it with all that has been learned, um, and uh, really harness all that potential that we have in front of us. So before we get to our wonderful panel, uh, me, Tom, and my book, I'll just in a minute, um, Dan Hahn, who's uh, one of the sort of critical people in the story from my perspective, as you can have the in California. Um, and I would like to have him sort of set the stage for the conversation that we're about to have. Dan um, is a long, long, well, he is a former full time staffer at Coke America and a current um, dear friend and contractor and the co chair of the Coke America Summit, along with Cory Zarek, who's here, who's the co chairman of this year, um, and is uh, one of the people who uh, sort of bridges between our world and the world. Sacramento and knows sort of how we got here today. So I'd like to ask uh, Dan to come up and say a few words. Thanks very much. So I'm um, going to tell a story. <laughs> um, so I'll take you back around three and a half years to uh, 2015, around March 2015. And at the time, I was editorial director at uh, Coach America. And um, as a result of one of um, the fantastic projects and the fantastic fellowship projects of Open America at the time um, on providing better access to SNAP and food stamps, uh, what had happened was. Hello? You can yeah. have yeah. Okay. Um, so, as a result of one of the projects that um, right here, <laughs> that's rather. <laughs> uh, so, as, as a result of one of the projects that, um, one of the fellowship projects that Code for America had been doing on providing access to food stamps through the SNAP system, um, the Department for Social Services had gotten quite interested in what Code for America was doing um, and had decided that they wanted to test and, and put their toe in the water and figuring out how they might be able to work with this non profit that was doing very interesting things with digital services and how people apply for benefits online. Uh, and I don't think they got exactly what they were looking for when they decided to enter into that first conference with Code for America. Because what they were looking for, uh, or at least from what I understand, was um, a bit more detail on how Get Help Rights was working. Um, a little bit more detail on how the fellowship team had put together um, this kind of packed together interface that made a point to food that's easier. And what they ended up doing was that they also threw in something else, which was a review of an RFP that CDSS, the Department of Social Services, had been working on for probably about the last three years or so. And it was an RFP to modernize and replace the existing child welfare system, the child welfare IT system that the state of California uses. Now, that system is called CWS CMS. Um, it was authorized in the late 80s, I think um, around 1989. It was finally delivered in 1997. So in 2015, it was coming up to about 20 years old. Um, the state had already tried to modernize and replace it once before, I think in the mid 2000s. Uh, and what CPSS asked us to do, um, what I ended up doing was providing a review of that RFP. Um, and um, a couple of my friends that Code for America at the time suggested that I take a look at it. I have a background in software engineering. Um, and for my sins, I also used to be a lawyer, so I'm very happy reading contracts. And um, so I've been taking a look at it. And child welfare is something I, I would say it's, it's one of the backstops. It is your literal think of the children system. Uh, the child welfare system in California, this system needs to look after about 475,000 reports of abuse or severe neglect every single year. It tracks about 500,000 
to three quarters of a million people in its system uh, at any one time, and those are children and adults. It's an absolutely critical piece of social safety infrastructure. And a new procurement was going to be coming out. They've been working on it for about three years. It was probably about 1,200 pages long, all told. And to cut to the chase, it was a traditional waterfall style requirements led half billion dollar procurement. And it was very, very difficult to be critical of the state because there isn't really any other way of doing this. And this is one of the things that became apparent um, when we started working with the state, when, when I met Mike Wilkins well, for the first time and when I met Amy Tom for the first time, which is that this is the that, that kind of procurement and that kind of RFP is a product of the environment. The state and the government doesn't really know how to do things in a different way. And the reason why things are kind of practiced that way is because people like to reduce risk. And one of the ways that you can reduce risk is you can just try harder. If only we could stop horrible technology projects from happening again. If only we could do that, and we could do that by just trying harder. If we, if we just spent some more time pulling our requirements together, if we were even more diligent about listing all of those requirements in the technology, maybe we would get it right this time. And I can tell by the reaction that no one really, really believes that that's true. And all signs on this RFP pointed towards another stereotypical large government project that would be most likely late or over budget. Or also not meet the needs of its users. And this, isn't, this wasn't really a surprise. What did end up being surprising was that when we took the report back to CESS, when we started talking to Maribel, the secretary back to the who is at Gov, and when we started talking to the leadership of CSS and then OSI and also MICA and some human services, um, what we started to see was leadership who, frankly, I'm going to say this because I'm about to say this, who are tired of having to nurse a technology process when there are really much more important things to be doing. There are outcomes that need to be delivered where people actually need to be able to, like, like Jen said, have access to, be able to rely on the services that we need. And we shouldn't have to pay all of our attention to massive technology projects that just aren't working. So what was impressive about meeting Mike and Amy and Maribel for the first time was we, we met with people who were pretty much tired of having to see the same old and were ready to try and do something different. And that's an incredibly powerful thing. Um, one of the key pivotal moments was a meeting that we had at the Code for America Summit, which would have been in 2015 that year. Um, going to out Jen and Jen was pretty distraught and I remember you being pretty much in tears because according to the timeline that we had the summit was in I want to say October October uh, and the RFP was going to hit the street in about two months time and to cut to the chase what ended up happening was we had a very high level meeting with Mike and Maribel um, a skunk works team was kind of convened to take a look at whether the state had the leeway or the opportunity to do things differently. Um, whether it would be possible to deliver this project in an agile and iterative way that would meet user needs. And I'm stupendously thrilled to say um, that the response was not, should we do this, but we need to do this. We need to change the way that technology is delivered in government because it just isn't working right. We need to be able to do a lot better. We need to be able to learn how to do better. And we need to be able to take those slow steps. So that is, I would say, a lot of the, a very kind of a high level background about what brought us to today. Um, I've been very, very privileged to be the, um, to see the support that Mike and Amy and others have kind of brought to seeing the need for digital services delivered in a, uh, it's also pretty emotional. <laughs> um, Not the only one. No, <laughs> the only one. Um,
There are there's probably about 150 to 200 people I would say working in the top of their digital service right now. Um, and they're all working incredibly hard and they're all there because of a stupendously important mission. And they want to do the best thing. And it is humbling to see uh, leadership that has been able to open up and take, from my point of view, extremely courageous and extremely brave steps to try things that haven't been done before because the alternative is to keep doing things in a way that we never do. So, with that, Thanks, Dan. Yeah, we're going to keep Dan right here in the front row. Just keep in mind because he's going to he's going to chime in. Um, yeah, it's not just child welfare where lives are at stake, um, and public servants know that and they care about that. Um, and um, as I look around the audience, I know that um, for the folks in the room, we're, you know, I don't know every one of you personally, but I know enough of you to know that this is the group that already believes that. Um, there are a lot of folks in our live stream. Uh, we've got some press on the live stream. And what the next part of the event is about is us collectively saying that we want this commitment to people. Um, and to using government's powers for good in the way that it should in the 21st century to continue, and what considerations should come in to making that continue and even accelerating it. So we'll, um, we're going to talk, and then we're going to make sure there's some time for you guys to have your voice too and know that other folks are listening. So thanks, Dan. Um, I'm going to echo that word courageous. I think public servants are courageous, and Amy and Mike are two of the most courageous, though I know many of you in the room are also enormously courageous. Um, uh, I think a lot of you know uh, Mike Wilkening, Secretary of uh, the Health and Human Services, and Amy Tong, the CIO of the state and head of the Health and Department of Technology. Please uh, help me welcome them up. <laughs> Sure, I just turn it on. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Sounds like you can hear me. Excellent. Good. So um, we had Dan do a little bit of a setup, and I'm going to give you some softball questions to start. Um, uh, let's start with you, Amy. Um, from from where Dan left the story, um, take us through to the next step after that. I was uh, three years ago. Seems like yesterday. And um, as Dan mentioned, uh, Mike and I have the privilege, along with many folks, I know Stuart and Angie here from the Government Operations Agency. And I also, earlier I saw uh, Karen Johnson and Karen Reeves in the back sitting over there from a cover California. And this is, I remember this is the time I was still with the Health and Human Services Agency working for Michael. And Karen was my uh, counterpart. Um, I'll, I'll just add a little bit of a context of when, around that time, a lot of things and so and what happened that Dan, Dan was absolutely right that we were facing with many challenging initiatives in the state of California that it wasn't just this one there were others who were still dealing with you know this this uh, perception or unfortunately sometimes you know it's ended up to be true it's very very difficult to implement large initiatives so I remember at the time Kevin right we were right around that time 2015 we were commiserating with each other my goodness there's got to be a better way easier way to do this so when the opportunity presents you know with you reaching out to you know, Michael and, and Secretary Badger and Marifel, talk about this is a great project to try to make different we jumped at the opportunity and I remember I was it's been real easy since then <laughs> <laughs> walk in the park uh, uh, other than other than there were Three weeks of period of time that Dan along myself with several other experts that we were in the conference room in the government agency trying to figure out how we can do this differently, but within the confines of the state government. Yeah. And we ended up doing it. Ever since then, it's been constant monitoring, constantly reassess how we're doing, and constantly learn and adjust along the way. I think that's the continuous engagement that's really easy. And that engagement is not easy. 
and later on we can you know talk about a little bit more on what that learning process or I call it the learning journey has been. Great. Yeah. I mean learning is the theme of the night. Learning um, and sharing those learnings with those who make decisions that we take forward. Uh, do you want to add to that, Mike? Yeah, I'll just say that when I started at Health and Human Services, there were two undersecretaries, and I made sure that IT wasn't in my portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. I do mean that. <laughs> no, it's absolutely true. And when we went down to one undersecretary, I had to pull back in. Um, it was also in that context that we were, we had healthcare.gov going on, we had Cal years of the state coming up. And so it was in the context of CalHERS, and, and I, I honestly, is the reason CalHERS is, is the right? eligibility enrollment system for Covered California and eligibility determination for Medi-Cal. Um, so really important system is the counterpart to healthcare.gov. It worked as opposed to healthcare.gov. Um, Touche. Um, <laughs> and there are lots of reasons that went in, into that. But it worked, and it came up in about an 18-month period. And so Amy was chief deputy at, at um, our Office of Systems Integration, which is the project management branch for Health and Human Services, and John Belay was the, the director at the time. And I've asked them to start looking into why did this work? And why did it come up in 18 months when most of my projects take anywhere from seven to 10 years? And you know, not that CalGears didn't have problems, but it was functional and it was enrolling people and so they were they were getting into that at the time that, that Jen came in and, and was talking to us about CWS SEMA. So I was already in the space of trying to figure out is there a different way we can be doing this where the projects can come up faster, where we can have something that's effective, um, that's actually meeting our needs. Because the, the reason that I made sure that IT wasn't in my, I, I was at the Department of Finance for 13 years before I came to HHS, I dealt with a lot of projects with the Department of Finance. And in fact, when I started at HHS, they almost threw me back to education because <laughs> there were so many high risk, high dollar projects, like 85% of states, high risk, high dollar projects were in HHS. And the way the state does procurement is, and I've said this in many venues now, it's truly soul crushing. It, it, it really is just, it will grind you down in terrible ways. And, well, I mean, think, think about it. I mean, honestly, when, when, I mean, honestly, what Dan was telling you is true, is that if you have a half a million dollar project that you know is going to come in higher, so it's going to be closer to the 750 to a billion, when you say that it's going to take you seven years and it's really going to take you over a decade, and at the end of it, you aren't going to be happy with the product you got, I mean, seriously, this is what you're going to invest your life in? I mean, this, this is crazy. And so that was the, the environment that we were operating in, and that was the environment that, like I said, I'd avoided it. But when I saw that there was something with CalGERS where it came up, I was starting to push my folks to, there's a better way here, there has to be, because this is crazy. And at the end of that, when, it, when all of those things came true, it was over budget, past time, and you weren't happy with it, we still would call that a success. Like that, I, I couldn't live in that environment. So we're like, let's start figuring out how to do this. We couldn't do the thing from Calgary is very unique, but that's what about the context of when when Dan and, and Jen came in and were like, your project's going to fail. And Maribel and I looked at her and said, yeah, yeah, you know, in, a, in an objective definition of failure, you're absolutely right. It is going to. But what's our option? Well, you pursued that option, um, and. Uh, uh, we now have a model that you feel is, uh, I think in your words, faster, more effective, needs, needs. So, um, uh, by the way, thanks for the credit here. I really, this is about, sorry, this is about you. So, um, if we, you guys do all the hard work, and I need a bunch of you here. Um, uh, but you now applied that. You said that that's great. Actually, I remember, can I say this in here too? In this meeting, um, Maya says, because we thought like, oh, like 2% chance that they're going to take our recommendation here. This is insane. And Mike in this meeting says, great, I want to do it that way, but only all projects that way. <laughs> 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 How about you? Yes. How about you? Okay. 
Stop <laughs> Wow. No one ever says that. Um, uh, so you yeah, had in, in health and services. Um, but Amy, you, you, you have been in a position in CDC to actually talk to you about your approach. So where else are you, have you been bringing this approach? Yeah, and so, so after that, that was 2015, I had the uh, privilege to be asked by the governor and the secretary. Uh, I've also consulted with Mike, say, let's, you know, go to the Department of Technology. And in there, they would have the opportunity to broaden this type of practice of this learning in a larger state, in addition to uh, health and human services. And so since then, a um, couple of examples, right around like, literally like two weeks after I'm walking to my new role as the state information officer, um, everybody knows that California was legalizing and so a similar situation, a brand new program that needed to be stood up with support uh, from the technology solution side of it. I will, the program is developing literally the regulation is literally being like, you know, ink out as we speak. And it has to happen by January of, uh, what year are we now? Uh, I can't even try, yeah, January <laughs> So we had a, you know, it's all blurred, all these years starting to blur. Um, it needs to happen. You know, in a very, very uh, short time um, duration. So we're like, only way to do it, got to do it in a modular approach, iterative approach, and level study expectation. We're not going to get everything right from the get go, but you got to start from somewhere. And so that's an initiative that I'm happy to report. It's been successful, not that good. Of course, there's continuous improvement needs to be made, but we met the deadline, we met the obligation, most importantly, we met the business outcome that we all want. Achieve. And so it's an example of that, the brain of system. I would have to say, and if this, maybe this is part we can just jump into, yeah. you know, why other things are good that continue to build that confidence, and this is what we need, because you do need assurance that we're not crazy here, we're trying something is successful. There's also challenges in where the field starts separating, right? When it's a brand new system, you know, we call it the green field, if you can do a program and a system from the screen. You have that ability. You, you don't know what you're getting into in terms of what is operating you know, expectation here. So something is better than nothing. But when you're kind of modernizing a legacy system, which is what the state and the public are facing all the time, that's a whole different ballgame here. Well, also your, your, uh, your regulations, your program rules have years and years of complexity. Whereas when you're in a greenfield situation, it may not be simple, but it's relatively new. It doesn't have years of complexity. Correct. Yeah. And and when you're looking at sorry, oh, keep on. when you're looking at uh, modernizing a, a legacy system, temporary put the technology side. I would even say by comparison, the technology challenge compared to the people in the process side of it, it's 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 probably you know not as I mean it's not a comparison. What we're trying to say, you know, is that when we get into an environment, we are tasked to modernize a, uh, a legacy process. You have to have the buy-in from people are using it. Not only people that are using it, but help them to think about why are we developing the system? Because until you know the, the introduction of this new approach, you know, put it on the child welfare system, the state of California has a tradition of building system for ourselves. Yeah. For ourselves to implement. Process, ourselves implement policies that we want to push to our customers as opposed to thinking reverse and say why do we exist we exist because we are here to serve you know our constituents our residents of California so that kind of thinking not as a, as a get-go takes a a big process change or culture change for people to even think about reimagining the business process differently after that and only after that we can get into now what type of automation, what type of technology you can do, so you, so you don't get into a situation of repaving the health path. So I'll pause there for a minute. Yeah. I, I just want to add to that. I mean, for those of you who know sort of the history of this movement, um, before, well, a little bit before we started doing this at Coast America, our friends in the UK started doing this, and their words for that, which is exactly what you're saying, but in British, is uh, meet user needs, put government in its second. Right? The government needs to go away. It's, it's amazing to me how often you see 
which people come to the same conclusions, you know, don't sort of, you know, have that necessarily have that language, but it's the same. It's the same. Like, talk a little bit about your experience. I think it's, um, that's the major change, is that yeah. actually figuring out involving the, excuse me, the end users and the clients. Yeah. And it's um, at the state level, especially with a state like California, where most of those benefits are delivered at the county, it's easy to forget why you're there. And so when I talk to, to groups of people in health and human services, when I'm, I'm talking and, and doing leadership academies, the, the first thing that I tell them is that you, you don't have a job because of the a Department of Healthcare Services, or there's a Department of Social Services, you have a job because somebody has a need. And connect with that. And it's the reaction that I get from it is, you know, it's so liberating on their side to, to hear that. And, and when the counties hear it, they're, they're ecstatic because you know, they're living that on a daily basis. But you know, we all have that common purpose, which is to provide services to people that have a need. And when you focus, on that person or that family, everything shifts. You, you won't design the systems that you designed before. Because when you look at the eligibility systems that we have, when you look at the enrollment systems that we have, when you look at how people have to find where they can redeem their benefits, how they can check on what their balances are, all of those things have been designed in a way that met government. They didn't meet the person. And so when you actually start to look at it from that family or that client and you say, okay, what's that experience look like? What, what is it that they have to do to actually figure out what their balance is? Well, they have to sit on a, on a call for an hour and a half on hold. Yeah, that may have made sense from somebody's perspective. But certainly if you're looking from a client perspective of somebody that has a job and has a need and and I, you know, one of the first things that I was introduced to Code for America is when I saw Jake speak about CalFresh and, and the whole Jake big Solomon. Originally, with others on the team starting CalFresh. Yeah, and talking about the enrollment process, where it, it just it, it really hit home that it's like I still use it as an example. I said you cannot look at the enrollment system that we have and the application process that we have and tell me that we ever thought of applying. You just can't convince me that that's, that was ever in our mind when we went forward. And we need to fix it. And the other thing that I tell people is that, you know, I have an agency that has 12 departments, $160 billion, 30,000 people directly working for it, over 14 million beneficiaries. And, you know, we, we need to, to break ourselves into silos just to operate. Uh, you functionally, to to manage an organization like that, you have to silo it out. But people's lives aren't siloed and they branch across multiple programs and across multiple departments. And it shouldn't be their job to figure it out. The silos exist for our benefit. We need to help them bridge those silos to get them the benefits that they need. Right. But we're talking about an institution that has evolved over you know, a couple hundred years now um, to work the way it works. So, you guys and others decided you were going to do something not in the mode of how that institution works today. And I'm sure that was super easy. <laughs> and it worked perfectly. Right? Yeah, not so much. <laughs> uh, you know, pivoting to, to something like user-centered and going to an agile modular approach, you know, I, I would have loved to say it's, this has all been seamless and you know, we have just these amazing successes and everything is done. Um, it's a struggle, and, and actually I had somebody that's talking to me recently about it and kind of the trade-offs that we have in different things and how if we just went one direction, it'd be faster. And um, so actually, in this particular project, the quickest solution isn't the one I'm necessarily looking for. Can you say what that is? You know, the, the quickest solution in some instances is to go to a ready-made solution. And so it's a, you know, if you can find the package that has everything, or at least most of the things that you want, and you just deliver it, that, that may be the fastest to a, an end point. Um, it doesn't necessarily involve the, the end users in, in that process. You probably have limited ability to change what that product looks like to reflect what it is that you really need. Um, 
I view very much, and this is a critical system, it has to be successful, but I, I also am viewing it very much as one of those places where we have to demonstrate that this can work. And we have to really use this as an investment in the state, an investment in the counties, a real change to really think about the end users, in this case, caseworkers and clients. And so there are all sorts of things in this that are more important to me than getting to it the fastest. I still want it to be faster than it, than it has been or than any other project has been. But in my priorities and where I weigh things out, um, there, there are many more important factors for me than, than things like cost and, and it being fast. Let me, let me say for a second on my mic, and I'm going to come back to you. So, um, so you two ended up in this position where you had a relationship before. You were then over at UBT, and you were able to say, we've got the agency, we've got the, the, the technology, the centralized technology group together. We're going to do this thing. We're aligned on it, which is critical. And that, that's what we need to sort of make this really bold. Um, that's often not the case, right? Um, uh, I've worked in government, many people who are working in government, where the, the, the folks actually own the program, own the outcomes, own the deliverables, um, aren't comfortable. Um, what would you advice would you give to somebody in your position? Say, for example, in the state of California, I have an administration just making that up, um, about working. Um, about making a bold move like that, or, or how, how would you tell them to work with, <coughs> with the technology department? I'd tell them to honestly assess the risk of the status quo. And <clears throat> we, we don't often do that. We say this is the way it's always been done. If you keep doing that, nobody's going to fire you. Nobody's going to hold you accountable for what happens there. But you get to exactly what I said. You're over budget, you're behind schedule, and you aren't happy with what you get. So honestly assess what the status quo risks are, and it, it changes your, your risk assessment. And it's also, um, I think government does a particularly poor job of defining success and risk. And um, you know, people that are in, in tech, one of the, the turning points for me is we, we went, uh, we were talking to, to one of the, the vendors in the state and just having a conversation about how they operate and where they invest their money, where they do their R&D. And so they said, well, you know, we go through this whole process and at the end of it, you know, we pick out seven projects that we're, we're going to invest in. And so they said, what do you think success is? And I had a room full of people that were from healthcare services, social services, OSI. And I don't think that anybody in that group said less than four out of seven would be success. And they just looked at us and said, one. One. I mean, this, is, this is where we're investing our future dollars. This is an industry changer. And two is a really good one. And if we hit four, we didn't think big enough. And you know, government's not private sector. We aren't going to do that. But it really made me start thinking about if I'm if I have to hit, and I did have several people in that room that said seven out of seven is success. And if seven out of seven is your definition of success, you can't take a risk. Like you you honestly cannot ever do anything that's other than the status quo because you you're gonna deviate from what you think your success measure. So it really has led to a, a more honest assessment for me, which I then give my people the, the space to, to operate in, where we are honest about failure, we're honest about success, we're honest about risk. And you know, I, I'm okay with a failure, especially with a modular approach, where I've got modules that are 10, 15 million dollars. I don't want them to fail, but if they fail, that's not devastating. A $500 million project can't fail. And you can't learn from a $500 million project failure. I, I challenge anybody to, to come up with an example where we've actually learned something from a failure that size because you're just in react mode. You're, you're explaining to the governor, you're explaining to the legislature, you're in front of the Los Angeles Times, 
very legislative committee hearings, and we are just layering on more protections on top of ones that didn't work in the first place. And we never really honestly reassess. Um, so we're, yeah, I'll get on my soapbox for a second and say it's not just government that holds uh, government accountable to no risk. Um, it's us, uh, like it's mm -hmm. the American, it's the people of California, it's the American people. Um, and you know, here we are in Silicon Valley and where we you know, purport to revere this, and in fact, do revere the market, right? Um, small, small failures um, uh, towards learning, and we purport to, to, to revere learning. Um, you know, how, how is this played out? And you know, how is this played out for you? What, what are the challenges? In, um, in operating in this model? I, I would um, heck a hard. <laughs> right? Heck a hard. Very hard. <laughs> I went beyond very, I'm like heck a hard. <laughs> Not heck a thong here, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Heck a hard. Um, very open. Is that, that I say? Um, yes. Um, I, I would say that um, while you know, and then this goes back to your early question, Jen, that, you know, the secretaries such as my boy and the other secretary in the state of California, like what kind of mindset, what what would you do for them to see that partnership is, you know, needed with the Central Department of Technology, whose task, was originally tasked, and I believe still the task, is to make sure um, that everything is done at the most success rate, right? The Department of Technology was set up to what is called a control entity. Control entity in many cases is telling people no, unless you have a, 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 a proof, you know, plan that nothing is going to fail, you're not going to move forward. So when the Department of Technology is operating that model, right, when nothing's getting operated, nothing's getting approved, you have no failure because nothing's get done, right? And then we get to the situation where you have technology uh, systems that are 30 years old, yeah. 40 years old, because why? Because everybody's so hesitant or not never thought of it enough, good enough a plan that the proof, you know, free, you know, air-free plan to in, you know enter into that kind of endeavor. You know, uh, when, when we were looking after we kind of got involved in child welfare, we went and looked back at it. I'm a researcher, and I'm sure you guys can this, but I didn't, but it was actually like 13 years, 11 or 13 years, that the state had been trying to reprocure the study. And I think, you know, yeah. what was it? Three or four times, right? I, yeah, three I, or four I, times. I've killed a couple of finance. Clearly, there are a lot of people saying, like, we know this won't work. I don't want this to happen in my watch, so just say no. Right? Like, well, and and that's, that's, that's the culture I went in when I was asked to step into the department. And, and you know, completely understand the situation, you know, the department is facing and in many cases I'm kind of feeling that at the moment too because because there's a such a, a risk, uh, you know, averse culture, nothing can fail, so status quo is actually safer. Until you're in a desperation mode that you have these systems that are 30, 40 years old. Well, right? It's safer by some definition. Safer by some definition to me just kicking the can down the road. So when, when this opportunity came up and I was asked to step into this role, and the first thing, I, I still remember, my I don't know if you remember, when we had the talk to say, do I go there or do I not go there? And he said, only go there if you believe you have an opportunity to make a difference. Believe the difference that two years later, when we look at a department technology, it's different than how we operate. Not slight difference, complete difference. And, and, if we, and, and that's what we're striving for. That if the department technology is not a good partner to help with these, I call it program uh, departments to deliver, then why do we exist? Right? Just like that program department exists to help with the uh, public constituents, control agencies such as the department, our clients is program department. So we should not be there for the sake of controlling. We are there as a, a value partner, but at the same time, you're representing the governors. Yes, it's completely my accountability. Right? I cannot say, oh, that's the department, they do it on their own, so it's on their own, I don't know anything about it. No, ultimately it is my accountability. So find that balance between what is it that we have to step up and own it, and at times we need to be helpful, and but, but not to the degree that it's so bureaucratic and nothing can get moved. It was the hard challenge that we were facing with. Right? Now, fast forward two years later, in finding that balance, have we gotten there? Probably not. Have we found that sweet spot? Probably not. 
but we have, have we inch closer to be more of a value partner instead of an entity that says no? Have, have we gotten closer to an entity to say, yes, let's find a way to get there? We believe we have gotten there. Okay. So that's a, that's a perfect setup for sort of how this evening has started. Um, I think a lot of you are, are here, you know, for these guys possibly read the blog post that I wrote called Dear Governor-Elect, um, wrote it before we had the outcome of the election, um, where um, I presumed to uh, have the year of whoever would get elected and, and said a few things about what I thought that person ought to do to advance this agenda. Um, and I talked about, um, really, well, I mean, really from my own experience, um, uh, I had the privilege of working in the White House for a year. It happened to be the only year of healthcare back up. And so I think what I saw was at the time a president who um, was such a very digitally savvy president. Um, we used to joke that he was the first president who knew what an API was. Um, and he really did, not kidding. Um, uh, and made it a priority to a certain degree, but it wasn't until his signature policy initiative got kicked in the, you know, the gut and um, literally the policy almost failed because of the implementation that he really and I'm talking about a guy here who, you know, in the second administration, you know, the president of the United States took time personally to recruit tech talent. Like that is not something any elected leader thinks, you know, is, is, on, is on their agenda and, and he really did it. Because he saw how important it was, and I would love all elected leaders to, to, to learn that. So that was part of, of what I was saying. Um, uh, I was talking, uh, you know, about a number of other issues uh, about um, how to shape the vendor ecosystem, how to bring vendors along, um, you know. Uh, but, but really, ultimately, how would the next governor make this a top priority? What would that really look like? So I had my say here, and what I'd love you guys to do is. Have your say. What is what is your advice? Um, I guess it's more than advice because you really have something to say. Um, but you know, as you said, like you, you've done the first thing, it's not done, right? How does it get done with someone new in charge? Either one of us start or which yeah. one of us gets fired first? <laughs> 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 if it's alphabetical order, I would go first. <laughs> I'll start. Uh, I'm dealing with fires. I might welcome it at the moment. Um, so, you know, I think that we've we've invested a lot in the last four years. You know, I, I think that Cal the California state government has invested in the, the vendor community. We've invested in our relationships with nonprofits such as Fit for America. We've invested with the research universities. We've really kind of been trying to figure out what's what's the foundation that to have to really move forward and um, it, it hasn't been easy it hasn't been without its stumbles and faults and um, HHS has been in the forefront of, of all of that we've been kind of the, the pilot as we've been going through these things um, GovOps has been very involved in it and helping us to think through what the approaches are but the actual implementation in a lot of cases have has fallen on, on HHS because we have amazing foundations that are willing to fund the effort. Um, I have, so the size of the, the agency, so I have the resources available and all of the large projects that we can experiment with. Um, so I, I think that we're really at that point where we're ready to, to really launch into that next stage of we, we just started an innovation office within the last year. Got Governor Brown just appointed the, the first director of that innovation office, Shane, who's, who's sitting here, and, and Tamara's back there as chief deputy. They've been spending all of their time recruiting people from inside of state government to come in and start really rethinking how we approach the, the problems that we have in, in state government. They think about center design approaches. How to really think what questions are that are being asked, what resources we have available, and what problems are we really trying to solve. And so I, I think that foundation is, is really there. And I think that the next administration, my hope is that 
it, it becomes even more of a priority that now that we have a foundation that there are all sorts of models that you can launch. You could start out and you could say, we're going to federate it and you can take the lessons from HHS and apply them as they apply to your particular agency. You could um, come in and say that as governor, I'm going to empower GovOps or some other entity to really be responsible for this. But it's both the authority and the responsibility to deliver. Um, you know, it's to think state use agreements. It's this idea that be it across the 12 departments of HHS now have a state use agreement, which believe me is not easy. It's used in the state of trying to get lawyers to sit down and figure out how that structure works. And honestly, was sitting in a room with all my directors and saying, we're done, sign the document. Like you, you know, I remember that. I was still working with Sergeant Thoreau. I was uh, working with Michael at that time. And remember, after the document was signed, what did you say? Please frame it. <laughs> I still have it. You still have it. Yeah. You frame it. Not yet. Okay, please do. Um, so, but I think that that means that's not just the framework, it's really the statement that you should be sharing data, yeah. that you should be looking across these silos to the benefit of clients. Doing it in a safe manner, doing it in a secure manner, making sure that only appropriate people are looking at it. But we should be doing that. And that should be something that every single department within the, the governor's purview should have to sign off. Every single agency department within the, the government under his purview should have to be on an open data form. And if there aren't data sets going up, they should have to explain why they aren't going up. And, and so there, there are simple things that you can do that will, because I think that it's really important to set the culture first. And so that's what we've been working on for the last three and a half years at HHS is trying to change the culture of our organization so that they're embracing data and they're ready for that change. But I think there are ways that you can, you can shortcut that given the experience we've had. And so there are things that we can get people to invest in immediately that are quick wins that people will understand why they're important. Yeah. And part of it is also, you know, the vendor community and, and you know, what I told people when we switched to the different approach on CWCMS is I, we went in front of a whole group of vendors. And I basically told them the same thing about what I expected out of CWCMS and all the, you know, what we would say was success. And it told them all that I wasn't willing to play in that anymore. And what I wanted were partners. And so, so this wasn't about the you know the existing vendors are bad. I said this is a dysfunctional relationship that we've developed, and I'm just not willing to play it anymore. So if you guys want to change it and you want a partnership, great. So let's do that. If you're not, go somewhere else. Don't don't come to HHS, and I positive to say don't come to California. Go and play somewhere else. But if you really want to partner and you're really interested in changing people's lives, then invest. I think those are all things that are quick, relatively quick wins across state government that can be implemented and set that culture that really allow us to then move into digital service, to move into really rethinking the way we approach our problems and interact with the public. I know there's a lot of people here who said yes to that after the partnership, so thank you for being They probably wouldn't be here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a little self-selecting. Yeah, and, guys, and I just, you know, for those who are listening, um, you know, from the administration, set the culture is, is a great, great three words to hear. Um, I want, Amy, I want to hear your answer, but I also want to put you all on notice that um, after Amy's answer, we're going to go on questions. Um, so I'll build upon what uh, Michael has stated on the setting of culture. Maybe I can offer a little bit of, like, what are some ideas to help setting that culture, right? Because, again, you know, we can say, like, culture and we can bring in training or we can tell you the success story on what the cultures are. But to me, actually setting the culture is, is more important to learn from adversity. If you only hear successful yes. stories and thinking this is an you know, easy thing to do and you can only handle success, that's actually not the right culture. So one thing I would really, really like to see is number one, you know, moving forward in the new administration, here's the opportunity, you know, as People moves around and think not in the selection of the agency, you know, secretaries and the department directors, more folks, and I'm not just saying this, but I'm just sitting here because 
and the movie fell in, more folks actually, you know, have appreciation and seeing what the, the, the role of a technology is. Yeah. The role of a technology is no longer a support role that sitting in the back, wait till all the business requirements are done, and let's come out and see what's going to back and what's done. Yeah. But instead, have understanding a technology is the enabler, so therefore involving both that with a technology mindset up front to help craft that, that strategy, to help craft that you know, plan, and to have also a better understanding of level set expectations and to define what success is. And in the two and a half years that I'm in the role of the state CIO, I've actually have seen you know success stories and challenging stories that really go really down to the culture of the organization that my organization partners with. The department that we partner with are more open for <coughs> taking ownership when it comes to that and inviting us to the table at the very beginning. High success rate. No kidding. The departments that are reluctant and saying, well, I only engage you because I have to, or I engage you because I'm at the 11th hour, or I engage you because I'm being told, you know, we'll see what happens. And you are you sitting on this side of the room, I'm sitting on the other side of the room, and we talk on people, we talk. Those are challenging budgets. Are not not the successful outcome. So going forward, part of a shaping the culture is, is look for individuals that, that understand the role of technology. Number two, I just built on is that Michael, you said that responsibility, you know, to um, afford right authority towards responsibility. I would add responsibility, authority, and risk appetite mm -hmm. because understand what risk mm -hmm. this is embarking and have the appetite to do it. You know, some others say, yo, yo, you are they willing to provide um, air cover in order to, to make you know, changes. We're talking to a room full of change agents here. And you're here tonight because you have that fire in you, wanting to try something that hasn't been tried before, or wanting to try something that, you know, is uncharted path. That involves risk. If there's no risk appetite, if the risk of averseness is still in there, it doesn't matter how much authority, how much responsibility is given to you, it's not going to happen. And so you either accept the fact that the safest route is that is quote, fingers crossed, on this exactly what happens, and that that is quote, or have a reasonable, you know, risk appetite, giving a reasonable minutes when it comes to authority and responsibility, and, and making all of this is a learning journey. So while you're learning that, you're going to be if that's the main mindset, you know, can be supported by the new administration, you know, the possibility is endless. Yeah. And again, for everybody on the side street, I mean, I have met to meet a person who has been criticized by the first, and then the next minute criticize government for taking this. Everybody in this country, um, we've got to be part of the solution, not just point the finger. Um, uh, I also just want to contextualize a little bit of what Amy's saying here and um, getting tech at the table from the start, not as the, you know, we can throw the spec over to um, that, you know, we have the privilege of spending time with folks who are doing this in other states at the federal level, at counties, in other countries. And that is what everyone is saying is, you know, these uh, silly moves in these trust policy councils, these underground devices, and this, you know, the one you've got to have. Um, technology at the table at the spot at the start because practices of you know of, of the discipline of user research really um, you know, starting with user isn't just about technology it's how we should govern that that's what she says so the fact that you guys are genuinely authentically finding the same work and so many others are finding the same thing I mean, so I think it's been a great, um, great start to the conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Um, I want to open it up to folks in the room, and we'll start with folks in the room. Who is going to carry the mic? Corey is going to carry the mic around. Um, so we'll start with you in the back. You could introduce yourself and ask your question. And then I want to let folks on the live stream know that if you've got a question, let Amy know, and then she will ask your question for you. So maybe we can do some of the live stream next, and we'll go back and forth. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Patrick Alwar. I run a little water data project. Uh, Hi, Pat. Hi. <laughs> and so, California has 58 counties. Swallows is served around 27 counties. 
margins serves the better part of 10 million, margin of 40 states, um, was designed for a sparsely populated 19th century situation. So many would argue that California is a 20th century government, or a 21st century government. So we kind of gently and respectfully push on with how do we have the courage to deal with those sort of kind of obsolete artifacts in addition to all the great, beautiful, heroic digital work that you guys all have. In many instances, it's just not working. I, the, the things that worked in the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century just simply aren't working. And, and so it's not a matter of picking things out and saying, you know, I theor this theory I have is whatever, and so I want to take this on. It's like, mostly we, we're struggling to, to provide services to people. And and that's, you know, it, it's what I think has really changed for me is this idea of putting people back at the center of, of government and why we exist, why we're doing what we're doing, and are we doing it efficiently, effectively, and humanely. And if you start thinking in those terms, it's pushing some of those, the changes. It's not that I want to change things, it's just change things. There are plenty of things in health and human services that are working the same they are as when I started as undersecretary 10 years ago and secretary back in May. Right? And lots of stuff didn't change. But it's different aspects of it that I think aren't working that really catch my attention and push where I'm pushing to say this isn't, it's, we need to change. We need to do things better. I, I would um, say that one thing we looked at, and this is also speaking of experience with the project pivoted to a more agile approach and modular procurement for the child welfare project is that, you know, yes, definitely understand the frustration that nothing is working, what's going on in the state of California. After we air out that frustration, we also take a step back and say, what are the things that may be there but we're just not utilizing correctly? So we actually did a very methodical, you know, uh, exercise, if you would to take a look, what are the true barriers that are preventing us moving forward? Are those barriers perceived? Or they're truly due to, I don't know, we don't want to break the law here, right? Or they're truly, you know, a, a real barrier versus perceived barriers. You'd be surprised if that calmness can be applied, if that thoughtful way can be applied. You can sift through what are the things that we can still navigate giving the existing system. And this is by no means saying that we can live with what we have today. But by knowing what we have, actually it can accelerate the changes from within. So for example, I know I, I saw when Mike was mentioning the procurement sucks, you were nodding your head in the back, right? I saw that. Um, you're right, that was exactly how we felt. But the way we fix it is not completely go through, give me a new legislation, let's how to you know, change the law and, and think about it. Instead, figuring out what's available, but probably very somewhere that we didn't know that was accessible. So what we did in the past two years, we were able to uh, elevate more in California what is called a leverage procurement. This means allowing the vendors to bid once so that therefore they are pre-qualified. So that they, every time they respond to a, you know, a, 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 a procurement, they don't have to repeat themselves many times as a way to help expediting some of those procurements. But at the same time, you know, we're recognizing that more holistic changes or, or your North Star go to simple, simplify, streamline procurement still need to be the ultimate goal. But I guess that's just my way of saying that this has come back to changing government or transforming government. It takes patience. It takes, you know, method of, you know, very uh, deliberate uh, step by step to get there. So, you know, when, when you run into challenges and, you know, we are so many times ready to throw out office, this is just not going to work. I would ask, come meet with us to tell us exactly what hurdles you run into, barriers you run into, and see if we can help you from within. Thank you. Um, we have a question from one of the viewers on our live stream who wants to know if some of these lessons learned that you're talking about and best practices for the future are being documented anywhere so other states and cities can 
follow and learn from. Um, Ooh, good so like they want to know about resources. <laughs> We should probably be doing more. Yeah. I'll let you guys answer. <laughs> we, we, should be doing, yeah, we, we should be doing <laughs> we more. We should be doing more. We need help. Uh, <laughs> it's a meeting. <laughs> yeah, it's, we, we've documented some of it in, in different articles that, that people have written over the last few years. Um, it's actually one of the things that I promised for this particular event that I was going to try to document more of what. Yeah, you did promise that. And the fire pit. And the fire pit. So it, it is something that's top of mind for me is that we, we do need to really lay out the, the story. Um, and I think that it's important for the next administration. If I'm, if I'm telling people that there's a foundation there that you need to launch from, we need to do a better job of explaining what that foundation looks like and how we got there and what the lessons were learned as we, as we struggled through some of those things. So it's something that, that Amy and I both have talked about doing. Um, it's one of those things that always falls off as you get buried in other things, but yeah, um, sometimes literally. Um, and so it's something that we have to do, I would say, in, in the next month or so, try to get those documented and get that put together. Amy and Dan, you want to add to that? Yeah, the studies work with the, 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 the work with the Kennedy School. Um, yeah. So um, I, I think some of some of David Eves' students over at the Kennedy School um, worked with HHS and Job Ops. Um, and interviewed, I, I'd say, quite a few of the people here in the room um, to produce a case study um, on the child welfare um, pilot project. So that, that's some of the documentation that exists as well. So I know that the state's been working with other institutions to, to start <coughs> pulling that together. So I'd like to stay so, Introduce yourself. I'm a student. I work at Job Ops. Um, was involved in some of this. Um, a lot of it, actually. Yeah, <laughs> including the case study. And I think, um, you know, watching from very close up, uh, the second chapter of the case study has yet to be written. And that's actually yeah. more interesting yeah. and actually a little more difficult to tell, but probably a lot more valuable lot. To, uh, to the folks who are thinking about embarking on this because you run into some very strong headwinds. Uh, in hindsight, maybe you could have predicted, but you sure didn't put it then. And there's, there are ways through them. And we're working through them. And I think that'll be valuable for other folks. So you've got, what, two weeks to bring that up? Two weeks. Question back here. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Hi. I guess you'll hold this for me. That's awkward, but fine. <laughs> uh, my name is Judy. I co founded a consulting firm called Civic Makers. We've had the privilege of doing work with California Health and Human Services in a couple different capacities. And we do a lot of work around this culture change, the human side of what's happening when you change somebody's entire life that they've been working in for 30 some years, right? When you change the, their entire system. And I'm curious about the level of buy-in that's needed because a lot of that work that we get to do is because someone who is in a position of authority, who has decision-making power, decided that user-centered and human-centered design is what they wanted to do within their municipality or their agency or their organization. And I got a question recently from someone who is more of a frontline employee about how they could further uh, that cultural shift within their, and in this context, it was a public library in a small town in Oregon. So I'm curious, Amy or Mike, if you have any insight into how these types of cultural shifts that are uh, related to people but also have to do with digital service delivery can uh, be sustainable when they're coming from the bottom up. The, the short answer is somebody that has a, a megaphone that's bigger than mine. And that's where I think the opportunity for the next governor is, is to, to really embrace that concept, to, to really make it foundational to the way that California government operates, uh, to take the lessons that we've learned at this point, embrace them, and move them forward. And, and that's, that's why you know, I, I think that this administration has done an amazing job moving this point because there was a lot a lot we had to do just to get the foundation set and just start understanding the terms and really start engaging with 
people that we're doing this for. Um, I think the challenge for the next administration is to, to really amplify that message and embrace it and embed it in government and make sure that it can't fall away. And, and um, you're absolutely right. So far, the culture changes that we're seeing is because there's a champion, there's an advocate at the position of authority that could request that. And for me, that I play that role just saying, we ought to do it this way because it's needed. But after five minutes of saying that, you almost have to, not almost, you have to roll up your sleeve to go with the people at, I'll call it at the front end level, the people that is going to be impacted by this change to now talk to them, say, what is the value of making this change to you? Aside from having to understand, you know, this is the best to serve our customer, external customer, the first question is, how is this going to impact what I do every day? What is the risk that I'm going to inherit as an everyday individual that doing a process in a method A, you ask me to do it in method B, you know, that requires I relearn my process, requires I rethink about everything. Why am I doing this? So this is the top down and bottom up kind of both direction you have to spend the time. And I say to today, we don't have enough time to spend on the bottom up. We could, we should be doing, you know, a bigger and better job at it. And yes, if the next administration, as Michael mentioned, can help amplify that, that would be very, very helpful. I'll say the other thing that, that we've done in HHS is that everything that we're doing in this space all is embedded in, in the governance structure that all 12 departments are participating in that is across the organizations. I have hundreds of people that have literally hundreds of people engaged in this that are helping to move it forward. And I've been very clear with them from the beginning of this, that this fails if it relies on me. That if, if it's all about me, when I leave, whenever that is, whether it's you know, January or it's three years from now or longer, it's if it's on one person and that person leaves, it all crumbles. And so, and, and it's not culture change. That, that's just directing people to do things. Right, so that's just figuring out how I can exercise power. So it's really empowering people to say this, you own this, you have a structure to do it. I've had people who've tried to tell me, you know, this governance term isn't sexy enough, but it's, you know, because all of the things it's doing, like it shouldn't be sexy. This is just the way that we do business. And that's what it has to be, is we have to get it into that mode of it's this is just how government operates. And then it's then somebody else has to actively try to change it. This is just our so there's a question let's, here, and I'm told this is our last question. Let's do let's do a quick thing where we get three quick questions, and then we'll answer them either all together or uh, the ones that people most want to answer. Is that okay? Hi, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jason Lally. I'm a data services manager for City and County of San Francisco. Our principal product is the Open Data Portal uh, for the City and County. Um, uh, one of the things uh, I've constantly been thinking about is you're very lucky in, in San Francisco to have the resources that we have. Um, the state law came out around uh, systems inventory, and we were able to be ahead of that. We already have local law around our data set inventory. That's great. But what I've noticed is that the, the resources available across the state vary from county to city. What role do you feel the state plays in the future of actually lifting and leveling? Playing field for counties and then localities trying to, to level up their, their own digital services and their data. And I mean, talk about criminal justice, environment, water, was mentioned, right? All those things really that, that data is quite that is local relevance. We want to roll this up to the state. So, what, what role does it do we all play? That's an awesome question, but I did say we're going to get one more off the light. So, let's do that too, and then we'll um, and we will uh, answer this too. And then we're going to still be around. I know there are more hands up, but we, we can't. So Amy, you got one more? Oh, great. Okay, Corey, can you get the mic over? We're right here. Okay, great. Yeah. Just building on some of the questions about the culture change, and already today, there's the technology and government separately, we can create up to three. And so the two worlds we can bring together, that are, you said back to your perspective to learning how to communicate and understand the different of that waste of time at the beginning. A lot about the government culture change, but we have effects of the technology culture to understand the game already. And also, 
Another fantastic question. And we'll do one, one more question and then we're gonna let the panel respond and then we'll take the rest of the questions um, yeah. after. Yeah, one more. Real quick. You guys just two more questions. Hi, my name is Andrew Fed. I'm a engineer and concerned citizen. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, what kind of incentive structures do you think within government um, could be changed to uh, better align officials with the outcome of the projects they work on? Um, should we just pay people bonuses based on metrics that are predetermined, or um, perhaps more closely couple it with risk taking to uh, promotions or being fired? <laughs> so, okay, so incentives. Um, uh, we have open data and we have advice for technologists to, to, to translate. Yeah. Last thing, I'm sorry. This is awful. <laughs> Tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try something. I'm going to see if I can provide an answer that provides next to the stall. Oh, that's so the to that. I'm gonna, that's exactly what we want. Yeah, might as well try something new here. Uh, not in any particular order. I'll, I'll start with uh, communication and then I'll touch upon um, the collaboration with the locals, elevating their participation in data. And then speak to what are the incentive options there for uh, government or public servant. All right, so I'll start with the culture change because that's where we left off. Um, I will say, you can see that in the video, this post right in front of me. Okay, I don't know where you are right now. Oh, just like that. Okay, there you go. All right, I'm leaning towards this way. Um, the communication, I, I will say, technologies in government, communication has to improve to it's a business communication, not a techie communication. Because this is it's help, you know, what it, what does it take for a culture change to happen, right? Is so it what does it mean to the individual? Whether they're uh, involved in the process of change themselves or the, their needed changes can better serve the customer. And none of those involved in that's involved in technology. And that's one of the reasons, you know, I have the privilege to serve this road is not because of my technology background, it's because of my business background. And to 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 bridge that kind of a, a value proposition. So the technology becomes an enabler. Technology is not the nuts and bolts and how they make it happen. It's an important aspect in making that culture change. So I would say to all of the technologists out there, how to find a way to articulate what you bring in the table in a business outcome type of language goes a long way in bringing, in enticing, encouraging the partners from the business side to be there, you know, side by side, um, going down uh, the journey with you. In many of those cases, actually, it dovetails well into data. Because data is one of those, we see it, it's not a pure, I call it techie techie, like the networks and this, you know, a, a, a coding side of it. But using data and finding the value in the data, we call it the gold mine, it's actually a perfect bridge between business value and the utilization of technology. So that therefore, in the starting of the transformation, when you know my time is in HHS, uh, Health and Human Services Agency, and then now with the top agency, aside from focusing how do we modernizing technology systems, our primary focus is where is the data ownership? Where is what, what can we do with the data? What do we like to do using that data to serve our public? And that transcends between state and local. As Mike mentioned, none of our services are purely, well, maybe the fire, the child fire, I don't know. Not, you know, lots of our services include that partnership with the local. Prior to joining health, I was with uh, the Environmental Protection Agency. I was with the Revenue Department. They all have local arms. So that type of nexus that can make through a data actually emerges the business value conversation. So it's not just a techie conversation, but it's what the technology can provide. And leading all of that is that kind of passion, is that kind of mission driven. I would say, unfortunately, at this point, at least at the state level, would probably be the only incentive that we have in terms of recruiting and retaining good talent as, uh, as a public servant when it comes to that. We don't have an opportunity to provide bonus. We don't have the opportunity to say, you get promoted tomorrow if you've done a successful project. We would like to do that as a way to reward. We constantly facing, especially those of us are, you know, appointed or you know positions. We're constantly facing the scrutiny. If you have a setback, they can ask for your resignation. So, if any incentive, I would say maybe on a monetary side, a little bit more job security would be good. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I think when it comes to public service, monitoring cannot be a way of 
you know, centralizing, but more of a vision for me. It would be nice if people said thank you to their public servants from time to time. Yeah, I, I think it's it's almost never about the technology. Yeah, it, it, it just almost never is. It's the the successes, the problems, the failures. It's it's not that the technology was the reason. It's there's some underlying policy. There's some something that's going on with the culture of the people that that's leading to to those things. And um, you know, it's for state government especially, we aren't going to be like that cutting edge. Ever, I don't think it's it's just not where government's going to position itself that it's going to be at the very forefront of what technology is doing. Um, but I do think that more and more governments looking for technology companies that share its values and that really do actually care about the people that the services are being provided for and how we're able to empower our staff and respect the jobs that they do. And so that's that's what I think we're we're looking for, and I think that's becoming more and more. I hope more the norm for um, for the interaction between technology and government. Um, as far as the the locals, the counties, in some instances, the counties are at least as advanced as we are, if not more. I mean, San Francisco and San Diego are two examples where you're doing amazing things with with data down at the client level that we're hoping to be able to do. Um, there are other counties that aren't there. Some of it levels out as you have common systems. So we're moving to, to one eligibility system for the for CalWorks and CalFresh. Um, that starts to level some of those things out, some of the functionality that you build in there, some of the ways that you think about how people interact with those systems, both on the, the caseworker side as well as your citizens. And so that's that starts to level some of that out, I think, as we as we start to engage in those, those projects. Um, and then I think just really being that talking about why it's important to invest in, in things like open data and why that's important. And you know, it's, and it's not some people kill me for this, but it's not a return on investment argument. It, it's really I think the transparency and the engagement with with people. And starting to think about how you how you work with your data differently, and think about your data are the real returns on investment for for things like open data. It's not that I save free AGPAs. Yeah. Um, it might be said that um, government isn't going to be on the cutting edge, or even it's not going to be the cutting edge technology, right. which I think is cool. Um, we always like to say we, we, we like boring technology, you know, uh, sustainable, uh, reliable technology. But I, I, when you were saying that, I was thinking, yes, the government is on the cutting edge. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not about the technology. It's really about what the mission is. And we want technology that works and that respects those values. Yeah. Um, so I think that's something a lot of people can get behind it to your question about incentives. I mean, my incentive is um, pretty full one, and I'm very glad to be sent to the year. Um, so I know there are a bunch more questions. Um, I want to respect the fact that we said this to end at 7.30. Um, uh, a couple of notes. Um, uh, yeah, I'm sort of surprised we didn't get a question, why did California create the California Digital Service, or should it? And um, uh, uh, it leads from Mark Kennedy, who all I have been um, trying to write that up, and we'll post that probably tomorrow if you're interested in those online today and check out our, our blog um, uh, for that. Um, I want to um, thank you all for coming tonight. I want to remind you all that Code for America um, does a lot of the work that we can do in this space because we get support from folks like you, and since the end of the year, think about us. And you get emails from us on that folder. Thank you very much. Um, and I just want to thank the two of you for coming tonight for all that you do. And I want to thank everybody in the audience um, for all that you do uh, to make this state work. And I would encourage you all, it, because I think everybody here has a vision, sees a vision for what California can be next, building on this great foundation, uh, to use your voices and make it clear. And um, I feel very optimistic 
about California's sort of the shining star of digital government in the next 40 years. So let's all be part of making that happen. Thanks for coming tonight.